So could you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your affiliation with Yale? Uh, I graduated from Yale in uh, in '94, uh, and glad to be back. And honored and privileged to be in these hallowed halls. I always uh, I was I was a acapella dog when I was here. Uh, I I, uh, I uh, sang in the Alley Cats and the Whiffs, and I always imagined in my life I would like to come back and work on the paper. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, I, I've managed to do that a little bit. <laughs> In, in, in LA through my screenwriting, uh, I'm a big fan of journalists and journalism. So at Yale, what would you say fostered your sense of creativity the most? Uh, you know, it was the other kids in my class, the other people. Like, you know, we had so many wonderful artists. Uh, I, I moved to New York and was working in consulting of all things and was not, I loved the people, but I was not enjoying the job so much. Um, and I turned to my roommate, who was uh, in the college got some lists for me, Alan Mariachi, who was our, our pitch fight. Um, and I said, I want to be more creative. I don't want to sing anymore. You know, I'm going to sing and shout, but I didn't want to do that. And he's like, well, creativity happens at your desk. And I was like, huh. I guess I could write. Spotlight, your Academy <laughs> Award winning mm -hmm. film. Could you tell us a little bit about the process behind that? Yeah, I mean, it was, um, it's funny because, uh, uh, you know, so much of, you know, so much of life, and particularly life in Los Angeles is all about luck. Um, y you know, there were uh, two producers, Nicole Rockland and Bly Faust, who had met uh, the reporters, Robbie and Mike and Sasha and, 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 uh, uh, and, and, uh, and Matt. Um, and um, and uh, they had gotten the rights. A number of well-known actors passed on the role of Robbie, um, you know, uh, and we, we were sort of a little bit as a, uh, we don't know what to do, and Tommy had a friendship with George Clooney um, because uh, he had been in Good Night and Good Luck, and George hadn't been available that fall, but was available the next fall, and so Tom sent it to George. And George says, I love this, I'd be thrilled to play Robbie. And so suddenly we had it. You know, it's funny because it went from a movie where, you know, nobody wanted to make a movie to then George Clooney was going to be in it and maybe Matt Damon too, and suddenly everybody wanted to make a movie. And so for a moment, we were the, you know, we were the, the bell of the ball and everybody was wooing us to try to get us to make a movie. Um, and then essentially Tom's, t basically George didn't want to do an ad scene. And Tom was pretty committed to the idea that Robbie has to have an accent because he is of the city, and Robbie does have an accent, a Boston accent. And George had tried that with um, uh, Clooney had tried that with um, uh, the the, um, the storm, Burke Storm, and it had a you know tell Tom and ultimately it just not done it I think, and um, and just was not just didn't think it would work. Um, and so we wound up parting ways, which was kind of devastating because suddenly, you know, we went from nobody wanted to make a movie to everybody wanted to make a movie to suddenly nobody wanted to make a movie again. <laughs> you know, and everyone would say the script is great, but like, you know, this was the ups and downs. And, and, uh, and then we got Keaton, who, you know, couldn't have been a more perfect Robbie, you know. And so, and, and in fact, I feel like that the, the, the movie we got with Keaton and Ruffalo and Rachel and Brian Darcy James, um, you know, not to mention, you know, Oliev and all the other wonderful actors we had, um, John, you know, like, I, it just, um, Stanley, like, it, it couldn't have been more perfect as it came out. Stephen is, is, is wonderful, he's been wonderful to me. Um, I am uh, an enormous fan of his work and of him as a human. Uh, he is a match uh, in every sense. Um, he is th 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 he, he's the most fun. Uh, and he's shockingly humble for who he is. There's nobody more excited to be on a Steven Spielberg set than Steven Spielberg. Getting notes from him on a script is a joy because it's always pushing the script to get better. And you can, you know, you know when you're, you know, as a, as, a, as a screenwriter, once you get a little bit of experience, you know when somebody's taking a script in a, you know, you can move the script in the worst direction, move the script in a parallel, okay, this is different, 
not 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 what I initially envisioned, not better necessarily, but not worse, just different. But then there's you know Stephen's always giving notes that are making it's like a great editor, right? Like you know just making your story better and 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 earning and owning it himself and making it our story and making it better. So that's one thing. Like that process with him is just wonderful. He's preternaturally good at. You know, at having the camera, you know, emphasize for the viewer what we're trying to get at, you know, and doing it with such style. You know, people talk about his blocking also, like, you know, so you look at when a Stephen film, and so much of what he does is in one, but it's not showing when it's not like these seven minute, like, I'm going to show you, I'm going to keep it all in one, and you're going to be like, oh my God, he didn't cut. It's just, it's within the scene. He's, he's using the blocking and the camera to artfully, you know, just, and it tells the story better. It keeps you held to what's going on better. And when he does cut, he cuts for a reason. Watching him was like a master class in, in, in directing. And, you know, the good news is like, and I literally would take notes in my, I literally had a, in my, a notes document with like, you know, Stephen lessons that I literally list and just reminders for myself of like, oh, this is what he did here and that's what he did there. But the amazing thing is you can, and this is what, I realized as a writer, I don't love to read other people's writing because I don't want to get polluted or watch. Sorry, it's not reading other people's writing. So I don't like to watch other movies. Like Tommy watched all the movies about journalism. I watched none of them. I didn't want to. I knew what we were after. I knew what I knew the scene in All the President's Men where Redford just keeps dying on the phone. He's in slow motion. I knew that was what we were going for. But I didn't want to pollute what we were, what I was doing, what I was bringing to it from my research, right? But as a, as a director, you need to be aware of everything that came before and how, you know, Damien, when we did First Man, he literally showed me at some point on his, you know, he, on, on Apple movies, he had bought, you know, every movie that had ever been made about space. Like it was literally like 50 movies and he watched them all because he wanted to study and see like, well, what has been done and what am I going to steal and what am I going to do differently and how am I going to make this unique? A lot of your films touch upon journalism. What compels you the most about writing about journalism? I, I think for me, there's a there's a bit of truth to power that always resonates with me. I think in in Spotlight, you know, one of the things that Tom Hardy is really good is he keeps asking, "What's this about? What's this about? What's this really about?" For six months, you know, before you even start to write. Um, and with Spotlight, he ultimately determined that the, the, the film was about deference. Right? and how so many institutions had just deferred to the church, and that's why this is wrong, including the book. Um, and the important thing, though, was that they eventually got right. You know, one of the speeches I'm proudest of, and Laurie, my wife, is always trying to cut my speeches with good reason, but this is one of the ones she likes. It's the Marty Barron speech, and it's the reason I don't think it's good is because it's directly from Marty Barron's lips. Liev says, you know, you know, we spent a lot of time stumbling around in the dark, and then the light goes on, and you know, it's can be kind of ugly, and fingers pointing, and you know, but this has been good work. You guys should go home and get some rest. And it was a hard thing. In fact, the thing we, you know, we didn't know, you know, how closely they had come to getting it. The fact that they had the story in '93 and buried it basically under Robbie's watch, right? Um, and he hadn't remembered that either. And so, you know, but the, to me, that is that is important in terms of the difference. What's important is that they stood up and told the truth. You know, great journalism is about exposing truth and letting it shine. There's a wonderful play that Yali Jeremy Strong is in right now because I have probably the intention of the people. Um, and it's all about him discovering the truth and actually the journalists there don't print it, right? And so, you know, I think as long as we have great journalists and great papers putting those things out there, and, you know, you hope that ultimately in the, in the, in the crowded marketplace of ideas, the good ones get to the fore and the bad ones, you know, fade away. So I think that's pretty powerful. So our last question. You're here tonight at Onios campus for a screening of Maestro. Can you tell us a little bit about the writing of that film? These two producers, Fred Byrne and Amy Dunn, had read my script about Gershwin writing Porgy and Bess and said, would you like to write about Madame Bernstein? 
at that fall. And I said, uh, well, I don't know much about Leonard Bernstein, but I do have a yen for dead Jewish composers. So let me take a look. And I had a buddy, actually, another guy, George Steele, who had been a, 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 a pupil of Protégé at the Bernstein's. Um, and, um, and I would heard some stories from him, um, knew a little bit of the music, and, and so started digging into the music. And uh, the one thing I had going for me was I, had, I was supposed to sit down with Marty Scorsese to pitch in this idea in early 2014, you know, when nothing else was happening. And I did. I got to sit with Marty in March of 2014 and spent an hour with him. It was lovely. It was, you know, earth shattering for me, you know. Um, and, uh, and he said, yeah, it's a good take, whatever. And then I pitched to Paramount. Um, and, uh, and that was the next project I was going to do. Uh, they took forever to make the deal. I got quite busy with Spotlight went into production and I was on set and then uh, I actually made a deal to do First Man before Paramount closed my deal on Bernstein, so I wrote that first. Um, but I finally got around to writing the Bernstein project and Marty passed and I slipped the script to Steven Spielberg because I had gotten to know him from the post. And he loved it, which was incredibly, you know, thrilling, right? When Steven Spielberg does a read through it tends to get covered in the trades. It got covered in the trades. And Bradley Cooper read about it, or heard about it. He doesn't read the trades, but he heard about it through Dave Bouillard, who was a manager, and he said, wow, I always wanted to play a composer. I'd be really interested. A conductor. I'd be really interested. Because uh, he loved conducting from a kid, as you know, much has been written about. And, um, and so when Steve and I finished the next draft, we sent the script to Bradley. And Bradley was like away on a vacation in Fiji and read it the same day, which is unheard of for like movie stars. But I guess when Steven Spielberg would send you a script, you read it pretty quickly. Um, and Bradley called right away and Bradley said, you know, if you want to go on this journey with me, I'd love to have you on board. Um, and so we got to work. Um, and it was a little challenging in the beginning because I had to wrap my head around a whole new way of approaching the material. But he very quickly found something that I hadn't. Because um, I think in my script, you know, it's a lot of really interesting, fun stuff about Lemmy, and it's clever, and there's magical realism and whatnot. But what I was really lacking was the emotional core, um, and that's what Bradley is extraordinarily good at. One of the reasons I love working, particularly with actor directors like Tony, you know, who's trained to be and like, you know, and, and, and like Bradley, is I tend to come at things structuring. I tend to think about the whole structure and then, and then go deep into character. Whereas Tommy and Bradley start with character and scene work. You know, what's driving, the, what's motivating this character? What are the reversals in the moment? What, you know, thinking about that. And so there's a really good way in which, you know, both in Spotlight and in Maestro, you know, I wound up pushing and pulling with my collaborators that, you know, ideally gets the best out of both, right? And ideally you meet in the middle you know, and, and the structure, and the, the structure, and the, and the and the character work match, and, and and become equally strong, and that was sort of the process. And you know, the other great thing about Bradley, you know, Bradley did this thing that I'd never done before, and I think it comes from his you know acting training. He was trained at the New School. He likes to read screenplays aloud. So we get we do three weeks of work. We get to a place where we were felt pretty good. We'd sit in just the two of us reading aloud. You know, he'd read more of Lenny, I'd read more of Felicia, but like neither of us are doing accents or, you know, or, or playing the part, although I was a little bitter when he just went to Carrie Mulligan when I was in the shop. But, um, <laughs> but, but um, uh, he, the thing about reading something aloud is it allows you to sort of see things that you, you, you really have a hard time seeing the 75th time you're reading it on the page. So we did hundreds of iterations of that script just like Tommy and I did. You know, and the other thing that's fantastic is, you know, um, oftentimes you can work and collaborate with a director quite tightly and then you get to set and your number one has a lot of ideas, right? And those ideas are often good, but it's painful because it's last minute and you're racing to, you know, add in and change stuff that you've worked on for a very long time. Here, you know, I was working with not only my director, but also my number one. So, and, and, and fundamentally what you're doing with a director in that situation, is you're, you're you're developing a shared vision. Uh, you know, working on I'm working on a script for Stephen now, and I got to the end of what I could do. This is the best I've got. And then he comes in, he's got all sorts of notes. They're great notes. I'm like, thank God, they're going to make it this much better. And I just didn't see it. I took it as far as I could, 
and then he took, he's now going to push me to take it even further, and that's what great collaboration is. So, um, again, I've been very lucky to work with some really great, talented folks. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for taking all this time to talk with us. My pleasure. My pleasure.